Hi, Jonathan. Uh, lovely to see you there. Uh, you're very well lit. And uh, I guess my first question is, how does it feel to be a disembodied head uh, floating above your audience? Uh, would you consider that very Meadsian, or is it more of a Cronenberg gag? <laughs> <laughs> it's becoming um, kind of uh, a, a, a practical necessity at the moment, it appears. I see. Okay. Well, we've just rewatched The Joy of Essex. Uh, when was the last time you rewatched it, and what things do you pull out when, when you re see it? Are there, you know, sort of technical points or things that you would see from the other side of the camera that strike you or bug you? Um, I ha have an acquaintance who, in the 1980s, directed a program called Howard's Way, which was kind of. Uh, Yachty schlock. And I went to lunch at his house once, and his wife said, oh, he's upstairs in his study. And I went up to his study, and there he was watching 10-year-old um, episodes of Howard's Way. Um, and I thought this is um, a good, um, this is a lesson here. Just don't watch your own stuff. Get, get, on, to the next, get on to the next thing. So I, t I tend not to... Um, go through my back pages. Right, so you, so you didn't watch it in preparation for any of this? I mean, on the occasions... You're just <laughs> freestyling, yeah. Sorry? You're just freestyling then. You know what it's all about. The <laughs> uh, yes, I mean, I can, I can, I can, you, can you know, one gets immersed yeah. in these things and you, you remember, them, remember them pretty well. Um, I mean, whenever you do see your stuff again, you think, oh Christ, that should not have been like that, we should have done it this way, or, you know, why has so much time been given to this? There are, there are always faults you can find, um, and one could go on forever um, picking, at, picking at pieces. Um, but basically, you're doing a job, you've got a deadline, um, more importantly, you've got an extremely limited budget, um, so you often can't repair things even when you have noticed them when you're still in the cutting room. What was the impetus behind making this film? Was it to make a film about Essex as a county or did the idea of, sort of communitarianism and these sort of utopias come first? Uh, no, it was two things. Um, one, um, the dangerous socialist um, Simon Heffer um, <laughs> remarked to me that um, I ought to make a film on Essex. And <laughs> secondly, um, well, he, d he, was, he was partly prompted by the fact that he knew that I knew Essex very well. I had a girlfriend who came from between um, uh, Whittam and Malden, uh, who I lived with all through the 70s. And so I got to, kn I got to know Essex pretty well in those days. And um, uh, there was that, that, there was the Essex which I knew, and the Essex, which Simon knows. Um, and on the other hand, there was this monstrous county of um, fake tans and celebs and um, people who are famous for being famous um, and seem generally kind of fairly violent and rather unpleasant. Um, and uh, I, I, th I, th I thought it was a, gr a great pity that this sort of etiquette should attach to a county which actually I find to be very special. I mean, I think the Essex Shore from, say, the Dartford Bridge up to uh, Walton on the Naze and the Walton Backwaters, um, Hamford, Hamford Waters and so on, uh, is, is a tremendous, I was going to say landscape, it's not a landscape, it's a land and seascape. Uh, and it's got something very very special about it. There isn't anywhere else really like it in England. Uh, the other side of the estuary is equally interesting, the Kent, North Kent, but it's of a completely different character. Um, it does have magnificent estuary, the, the Medway, but it doesn't have the, the creeks in quite the way that, that, that Essex does. I'm also very fond of hulks and rotting boats, and it's, um, it's, it's very good if that happens to be your, um, your, your, your dada. <laughs> so whose idea was the DJ? Mine. 
I see. <laughs> and uh, I mean, it, it just picks up on a very, uh, I guess it takes the Partridge thing slightly more seriously than the Partridge ever takes it. It's genuinely part of that. Um, how uh, the, the, the closing line of the film talks about um, a, a, a sump um, of eternal uh, Dr Drybergs, referring, I assume, to Tom Dryberg, who's, who's mentioned earlier. It's a very gnomic uh, closing point you're making there. Uh, sort of well, I made. I, I, I used the word. I used the words s s swallow. Yeah. And there was nothing that Uncle Uncle Tom liked more than to um, swallow someone else's sperm. <laughs> um, and um, he was very well known for it. In fact, Francis Ween, in his magnificent biography of um, Dryberg, actually invented a word for it, which was spermophagus. <laughs> um, add to your word power. Yeah. I mean, Dryberg's a man who's kind of receded into the pages of history, though. I mean, I don't know if people under 50 would necessarily know who he was. Why does he hold a particular, I don't know, affection, animosity to you? No animosity at all. I mean, I, I, I was very fascinated by people like that. I mean, um, I think the uh, one doesn't get people in public life like that any longer who are so manifestly politically incorrect and over the top. Um, and uh, I think it's a, a great loss that one is, you know, um, the, the world is full of people like Philip Hammond, who I imagine doesn't swallow other men. Um, well, well, I mean, it's interesting uh, you say that because um, Dryberg's seat is now claimed by um, John, uh, what was his name, who, who was the culture secretary, Whittingdale, until recently, uh, who exhibited some of the same tendencies. In, he went out with a, a woman who was later found to be well, an escort, Well, yeah, but in, in a ra rather banal way, yeah, <laughs> I thought I thought I thought it was a pretty pretty banal show, and he doesn't have the kind of chutzpah to go with it. Whittingdale Wh Wh was. Um, oh, okay. I mean, it, uh, there was a there was a wonderful moment um, which Ween recounts about Dryberg taking Mick Jagger and um, Marianne Faithful to dinner with W. H. Auden. Jagger <laughs> didn't turn up, and Auden looked across the table to Marianne Faithful and said, "Tell me." Um, when you're smuggling drugs, do you pack them up your ass? <laughs> um, and th these, were, these were actually very Essex people. I mean, not Auden, but um, Francis Bacon had a house at Wivenhoe. Dickie Chopping had a house there. There was an extraordinary sort of um, menage, uh, God knows how many, seven or eight, um, run by, among others, Mo Morris Cowling. Um, th there was a, a degree of libertinism, which um, has, now, has now been lost. Perhaps we can move on to something like dinky toys. Yeah. <laughs> that's, I mean, that's very sad. I mean, whenever you talk about sort of communitarianism in your films and these kinds of alternative communities, you know, there's a certain down-the-nose quality to it. I don't know if that's just how you talk or whatever, but, um, you know, I would just wonder whether you ever feel any need, desire to dissolve yourself within a greater community, whether that idea has ever had any merit appeal to you? Uh, no, I'm, I'm kind of one of those solitary loners who goes and <laughs> shoots up shopping malls. Yes. Um, <laughs> no, c c communitarian life has always struck me as being rather, rather hellish, and I got a very, very small dose of it in my late teens and early 20s, and that was that was that was quite enough. Um, I oh, think that uh, if I look, I don't think I do look down my nose at it. I'm extremely interested in it. I'm sort of very fascinated by such books as Gillian Darley's *Villages of Vision* and um, uh, *Utopia Britannica* online. Um, but the thing is that you know they're all going to fail. They they they, you know, it's a form of. Uh, demographic um, joining, which um, simply never comes off. Even if, even if the community itself builds, you know, something special which is bespoke to it, 
there's, it always fails. I mean, anti-hierarchy doesn't really work. Um, and that, that's, you know, that's the crux of it. What was your experience? I mean, but that's no reason not to try. Yeah. I'm sorry, I couldn't hear. What was your experience of communitarianism in, in your late teens, early 20s? How, how close did you get? Well, I, I and my then girlfriend shared a flat with um, two people, um, one of whom was never there. And yes. so odd bods used to sort of, well, it was a huge, huge flat. I mean, it had 12 rooms um, and was rent controlled. And p people used to turn up and we, didn't, we never knew how to get rid of them. On one occasion, we got a friend round who um, took an instant dislike to this guy who'd imposed himself on us. And we were sitting down having some sort of supper. And um, suddenly there was a scream. And this, um, this friend of ours had bitten this guy in the thigh. Um, so he left. Um, on another occasion, we got the same friend round to remove some vegetarians. <laughs> who were, well, weren't just vegetarians, they were pro proselyti proselytizing vegans. And this friend, who I shall name as Dusty Hughes, the um, playwright and scriptwriter, had this great idea of going to the fridge and getting a piece of liver and sticking it into his flies and just walking <laughs> into the room wh which they'd taken over. Um, and they moved out very quickly. Um, so you, you, you can counter communitarianism. Quite easily see. done. It's, it's a battle we should all be fighting, I suppose, yeah. Is there, I mean, yeah, when we look at uh, men like Barter uh, and uh, Crittle, th there is a golden age of those kinds of, um, sort of you know, work-based, the factory, and, you know, the, the, the happy worker is the productive worker, whereas nowadays, you know, the, the maximum model for productivity seems to be the sports direct model. We've definitely past that, that golden age of uh, you keep your workers on site. But would you see any kind of parallel, I don't know, with maybe you know, the, the software industry, that sort of tech hub, Apple's infinity loop or anything like that? Is there still a role for the worker bees to be happy in their productivity? I don't think from what I've read about Apple and Microsoft and the, the other sort of Californian the Californian giants, that there is much desire to make your workers happy. It's much more like, you know, going back to some kind of behaviorism. Um, carrot and stick. Um, and uh, I think, I really think it's quite, quite sinister. I don't think there's anything particularly sinister about barter or about crittle, save that you just had to join in with everything, which for someone like me would have been a kind of hell on earth. Um, but the, the, uh, I'm sure they probably do exist in a kind of very small way on landed estates still. But um, the factory working like that, you know, Port Sunlight, um, Ackroydon, um, Salt Air, etc. They've all gone. They've all gone their d different ways. Cadbury um, and, and so on. I mean. It's, it was, it, was a, it was done in the, the very best intentions. I mean, most of the families which established those sort of um, uh, villages were, were Quakers. I mean, there's some extraordinary link between Quakers and chocolates. I don't quite know what it is. Um, uh, and uh, it, it w was done in, in good faith, and it worked for a fairly long time. One of the favorite facts that I turfed up in, in researching this is that uh, after Barter died in a plane crash, his brother took over the company and then installed his office inside the lift in the 21-story uh, uh, head office in the Czech Republic, was in Czechoslovakia, and was at travel between floors, sitting behind his desk, uh, working along, uh, at, at, you know, and then managing as he, as he went via, uh, at, at, at each floor. Um, I mean, do you think that could be replicated by today's uh, software tech giant CEOs? Is that a neat touch? Well, it, it, of course it could be replicated, but I mean, would you want to replicate it? That's, that, that's, the, that's the question. But on the other hand, yes, I mean, CEOs who are in um, 
more direct contact with, with their workers, probably a good idea. I don't know anything about this. I've, 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 I've never worked in a factory or an office. <laughs> um, one of the best lines in the whole thing is probably when you talk about Poundbury being a Thomas Hardy uh, theme park for slow learners. Uh, I mean, I guess what we've got with the present housing crisis is a role for the state, a role for privateers, which you're going to get on to at the very end of your film in another sense, which is a Cockney Shangri-La angle. Um, and then, I guess, a role for corporate elements within that. What do you think, given the amount of building we're going to have to do over the next 10 years, is the, the best balance between those three and or any more? Well, I'm not sure what the three are. I, mean, I certainly think the kind of Poundbury, new urbanism, seaside um, uh, solution is not a solution. Um, it already looks terribly, terribly dated. Um, Poundbury is a particularly bad offender because it ruins the view of Maiden Castle, which is one of the greatest um, earthworks in, in Europe. Um, what were the other two? The other two were uh, the sort of corporatism of Barter et al. or that thing, and the sort of private. But what do you mean by corporate? Building. What do you mean by corporatism? Uh, just the idea of, of corporations coming in to put down plots on that. Yeah, but that, they, they might come in and they might build sort of um, folksy Poundbury stuff, or they might build um, rational sort of neo-60s buildings, uh, it, it, it's, it, it's, it, who builds it doesn't really determine how it's built. Mm. <laughs> OK. Um, what do you remember from the making of The Joy of Essex in terms of going out to, to film it? I gather you are given about half as many days to make these things now as you were a decade or more ago due to BBC cuts. It feels like a very intense process now. It, well, it is very intense. Frank Hanley describes it as being, it once described it as, you know, we used to be a convoy, now we're one smart car. Um, the, um, the main thing one remembers is being, of all of these shoots, uh, is just being incredibly tired. Yeah. of kind of, you start at eight in the morning, you finish at about eight o'clock, you have something to eat and drink, and then you crash out, and that's it. I mean, you know, this, it, we're not like Led Zeppelin. We don't have a, an airplane full of groupies. <laughs> it's, it's sad, very sad. Um, what is the state of your relationship with the BBC nowadays, and, and how do you see its commitment to the type of documentaries that you make, and that, I guess, you know, high art programming. Um, I mean, would you say it's going downhill, uh, more downhill, or as downhill as it ever has been? I think it's going downhill. I don't think, I, I, I don't think it's the sort of type of program I make. I don't, there's no one else doing the same sort of thing. The near, nearest person, I suppose, is Adam Curtis. Um, but he, um, he doesn't get much um, pecuniary favor from, from the BBC either. Um, it's it certainly, you know, I mean, I'll do a couple more and then I think I'll throw in the towel. Yeah, are there any uh, couple more that you feel you'd like to do? Where, where are you going next? Well, there, there's, there, I'm working, I'm working, on, I, I'm working on, on two programs at the moment. Um, you know, whether they'll come off or not, I don't know. Mm -hmm. um, but I... I uh, I, f I feel a kind of uh, slight aggrievement that virtually moronic footballers get paid huge sums for saying he nodded it in the back of the net and he's, he's got, he, oh, it's only banter. Um, and um, whereas people like me who can actually do something um, are regarded as poor relations. How are you going I'm actually not that bitter about it. I suppose I should, yes. I, I should, I should, I should, I should be very, I should be really bitter and kind of, um, uh, you well, know, the Tuggies silent handkerchief. 
Well, yeah, I mean, you're an enormously magnanimous man, I guess, in that sense. Um, but um, this festival is about Essex and, and the rebranding of Essex in some sense, and that's a horrible term, placemaking. Um, if you were the marketing manager of Essex, what would you recommend they do to, to jazz up their image? God, I would have thought the thing you need to do is get them to jazz down their image. Yeah. <laughs> I, mean, I don't like the idea of branding and, and so on at all. Um, I think that I don't like tourist boards, which are you know, simply a dishonest form of PR. Well, all PR is dishonest, but it's a particularly dishonest one. Um, I don't think, I think places that, I think leave alone. Don't, don't, you know, don't mess with things unless they're broken. And Essex isn't broken. I mean, it, it's, um, it's, it's got, holds huge appeal for me and I imagine for hundreds of thousands of others. And um, it doesn't need to have a kind of, some sort of cosmetic, spray applied to it. Um, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm happy with it as it is. Um, but then I, I really dislike that idea of crap towns. I think, I don't think there is such a thing as a crap town. I think everywhere is interesting, everywhere is fascinating if you bother to explore it and exhibit a kind of curio a curiosity towards it and, and make, make yourself find it fascinating. Um, so, I, 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 I like leaving things alone. I mean, uh, on a more serious note, I would like to see a moratorium on building in Britain. <laughs> um, building in Britain, yeah. I think, has got out of hand. Um, and lots of, you know, awful bling blocks of flower, uh, tower, towers, which are not any use for the current population of Britain who ca ca can't, can't afford them. I, I'd like to see, you know, prop decently done social housing of the kind that, say, Camden did in the late 60s and early 70s, that done everywhere and done, done cheaply but res and responsibly and um, sustainably. I hate using the word sustainable, but it needs to be sustainable. But that, that's what should happen in Essex and it's what should happen everywhere. And, you know, the, 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 the oligarchs, you know, they can come here if they want. They don't come here because they know they're going to get robbed. <laughs> Is that, so, I mean, even if you were given a lit match and told you can burn down one bit of Essex uh, and uh, no, no questions asked, you would not light the taper on Basildon Town Centre? I don't know. What would, you, what would take your fancy? I, I, I wouldn't burn down anywhere in Essex. I'd, I'd burn down quite a lot of the city of London. Right. <laughs> Any, where would you start there? City of London. Oh, any, just yeah, anywhere. Just I'm, I'm sort of. I'm, I'm a very. I'm, I'm a very promiscuous pyromaniac. <laughs> I see. Is it, I mean, I guess there is that, you know, that London thing. I think you said to me on, a, on another occasion that it's beginning to look like uh, downtown St. Louis or something like that. There is a sense that London is becoming swamped by its own sheer anonymity of, of the stuff they're, they're throwing up now. Well, there, there is that thing that people proudly say, oh, London is getting to like, look like Dubai or Qatar or something. But it's not. It's getting to look like Tulsa or Colorado or, uh, I don't know, Sioux Falls. I mean, um, it, it doesn't look grand. And there's only a, only a t when you come into London from Essex across rain and marches, you see what a tiny proportion of London is actually high rise and how ill it accords with the rest of London. Um, London has been a predominantly low rise. Um, megalopolis for many, many centuries and doing what is being done to it at the moment um, detracts from it. Hmm. There is a man whose job it is to sculpt that particular patch of skyline down by, uh, sort of centred around the Gherkin and, and Tower 42, it works for City Hall. Um, he would argue it's a bit of a work in progress, that uh, give, it, give it 10 years, give it 15 years. 
But it's, it's always a work in progress. I mean, uh, yeah, the, the, the Elizabeth London? line is a work in progress. Well, no, it's never going to be finished. It's, a, it's, a, it's a, an interminable building site. There is no end to it. Mm -hmm. And that is what, what one has to face if one lives there. I mean, I, I'm very glad not to live there any longer, but uh, par partly because of that. I mean, it, it, where, where I lived, in, just around the corner from where they were about to start building the, um, the shard, um, it, it turned into a sort of Hawley's convention. It still is. Are you, uh, you're at the Unité d'Habitation right now, are you? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> what, what could we see behind you? Is that your balcony? Uh, no, you can't really see yeah? much. I'm not, I'm not quite sure. You just see a sort of vague, um, vague view of the western side of the building. I see. Marvellous. Uh, would, would you like to take some questions from the floor? There are some people out here who I've been told might have some questions for you. Yeah, sure. Sling them over. Okay. Can we have some questions from the floor? I believe there is a roving mic, so someone's going to rove, and you should be able to hear them with a little bit of luck. Hello. Uh, one of the, one of the uh, things that uh, you may have uh, found in your research for the Essex program was when these uh, estates and uh, developments were built, did they give any consideration that we do nowadays to the actual livability, the maintenance and so forth and upkeep of the homes? Uh, in a word, no. I mean, the, 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 the plot lands in Landon, Basildon, Pitsy, Jaywick, etc., frequently didn't have services at all. Um, and they, there was not an infrastructure, there weren't tarmac roads to them. Um, so it was a pretty a kind of wild east way of living. Anyone else got a question? For Jonathan. <laughs> oh, there we go, up front. Um, I just wanted to ask about utopias. So I think the entire program is probably about, as you said before, utopias don't work. Do you think anybody will do utopias again? Or do you think it's a dead idea for centuries? No, I think they will. I think it goes on and on and on. And I, I don't think one should castigate anyone for trying. Uh, you know, better to try and fail than, you know, not, 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 not try at all. Um, but what they'll, they will reappear in, I suppose, different forms. And uh, th there's every hope, I would have thought, that they could be more successful now because technology, whatever else technology has done, it has diminished in size. It, it's portable, it, it's usable in a, in a, in a, di a different, different way. I mean, what, you know, we, we have phones now which can do what 50 years ago an entire room in a bungalow could do. Um, towards the end of the film, you seem to be talking quite positively about the uh, do-it-yourself style landscapes or townscapes, as opposed to the more planned communities that you talk about um, in the first, sort of first three quarters of the film. Um, is that, uh, like, is that a, a model that you do think is worth investigating more or continuing or, or, or continuing to do? Um, yeah as opposed to what you were talking about in terms of let's do Camden Council style estates everywhere? Well, people have tried to, tried to build for um, wilderness and inconstancy and so on. And it seems, it seems never to have come off or doesn't come off in a big way. But th th again, there is no point in in eschewing it as an idea because it's failed in the past. Um, but the, 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 
the attraction of towns, cities, conglomerations, and so on, is largely, I would say, to do with the fact that they are various, that they move in material, scale, and use over a few hundred yards. Um, and uh, you don't get this in Paris particularly, because pa 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 Paris is homogeneous. But in most, most Western cities, you do get this clash of scale and use all over the place, which is actually, I think, what, what, what makes them attractive. Um, it's very difficult to plan for that, though. Because you've been a fan of, of containers and uh, porter cabins and using those kind of very temporary bits and pieces in, in a more permanent way as one method of, of changing our landscape, of, of building uh, in, a, in a more interesting and, and diverse way, which is obviously kind of a, um, parallels the, the plot lands of uh, the Essex coast and uh, your, your other film on plot lands. I mean, how much of a solution is that? It's, it's, it's a lovely idea, and it sort of chimes with a lot of your sort of, sort of libertarian, anarcho-syndicalist ideals, but how, how actually practicable is that on a more mass scale? I think it's very practical. I mean, containers are not, not expensive. They, they are also extremely flexible. They can be conjoined in all sorts of different manners. Um, the, the best example of this that I know is in Rotterdam Harbor, which is on a massive scale. Um, but we've also got s some smaller, at Leemouth, there's some rehearsal rooms just opposite the, on the, on the north of, of the river um, where the dome is. Um, and th they, p people have not been allowed to live in them, but I don't really see why not. I mean, if, you know, you can join them up to the sewers and services easily enough. There's no, no problem. It's, it strikes me a, a wonderful, wonderful way of building um, straightforward homes for people who are unfortunate enough not to have such a thing. Is that, I mean, that seems to be part of your vision, this kind of human honeycomb thing, this idea that, yeah, I guess it's just parallel to what you were just saying about the, the joy of cities being in, in the sheer diversity of, of landscapes and people fitting themselves in in a very individual way. Well, yes, I mean, the, 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 and people do fit themselves in in all sorts of ways, but I mean, the thing is with containers, you can, put containers on tops of other buildings. Um, we should build up from what's there already, not, you know, sort of... <coughs> yeah. Not, not find a plot which is, which is pure. I mean, the best things that never really are pure. They're always contaminated by what's been there before and so on. And I, I, think, I think containers is a fantastic opportunity. Just knock them on top of things. Anyone else got a question? You spoke, you spoke earlier about um, sort of all these luxury flats being a big problem, but oh, mic up a bit higher. Okay, but the other sort of uh, alter problem I've been noticing is in England, as much as in France we're living right now, is um, these huge um, sort of sprawling estates that the volume builders seem to be building. Is there a way around that to build suburban, to build suburbia in a new and better way? Well, I don't think you need to rebuild suburbia. You need to main maintain what's there already. The same thing happened in France as happened, happened in Britain, that people built um, vast um, megastructures and uh, then completely forgot to maintain them. I mean, you don't, you don't buy a car and not take it to the garage. It's as simple as that. But, I mean, you, you know, you could, you could... They would... People who were decanted, and that's a word that was used a lot, decanted into these apartment blocks, um, were given no protection. There, was no, there were no uh, guardians. There were no, um, uh, whatever you call them, concierge. Um, people could just walk in, piss in the lift, deal drugs in the lift. 
I mean, you've got to have a certain amount of defensible space. And they didn't, they didn't get it. But there's actually nothing wrong with the buildings themselves for the most part. They're, sure, in some of them there was too much asbestos. Uh, sh sure, they, they used some very dodgy um, systems like CLASP. Um, but usually they were okay. And you look at places like um, thing on Erno Goldfinger's thing, Trellick Tower. That is now hugely desirable property um, because it's been properly maintained. And there are dozens like that around the place, not, not just in London, or in all of the big cities, and small cities as well, actually. Um, I just wanted to hear some of your thoughts on how a county that seemingly was a hotbed of uh, collectivist and uh, utopian projects also became the county that spawned that figure, Essex Man, uh, the city commuting, um, white van driving, occasionally racist, yuppie figure. Well, the, uh, all sorts of people coexist in all sorts of situations, I think. I mean, you could probably have found Hertfordshire Man or Surrey Man or Middlesex Man. I mean, they're, 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 I, I very much doubt whether es the, the creature called Essex Man is exclusive to, to Essex. Um, it's perhaps just a bit more noticeable there. But um, I, I, th I think that in any area, you're going to find a... Uh, a, a fairly considerable mix, apart from those areas in which there have been class clearances, like, you know, like great chunks of central London now, where you know, there, there is no one apart from the very rich. Let me just move the mic around, and there we go. Uh, Hi, Jonathan. Uh, my name's Gary. I grew up in uh, South Yorkshire, a town called Doncaster, which was an uh, industrial-based um, growth during the last uh, century. Um, since lived in Essex for many years, I just wondered what you thought uh, about the likes of Bourneville and Roundtree and also here, uh, where we are today. I wondered, um, these uh, businessmen, capitalists um, had a social responsibility to their workers. I wonder what you thought of, about um, the likes of Google and Amazon having a social responsibility towards their workers and how the governments of today could impose the, that sort of thing on them. Um, I don't think uh, Google and Amazon are persuadable. And I don't think governments today are, would be likely to want to persuade them. The, the thing is that with the first the socialist government of Attlee, 1945, you, it's almost as if the government took over the idea of noblesse oblige, took over the idea of the aristocrats' responsibility to the poor. And th those governments were mostly composed of a particular kind of public schoolboy who'd worked at missions in the, um, like Toynbee Mission in the East End. And um, they were uh, imbued with a, 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 a sense of social responsibility. And that continued through what became known as the 13 years of Tory misrule to 1964 when Harold Wilson got in, and it continued. But then as soon as Mrs. Thatcher got in, Mrs. Thatcher wasn't a Tory of any kind. She was a Manchester liberal. Um, and I, f I find one of the most telling things about Thatcher is the sort of peculiar alliance between Thatcher and people like Branson, um, who um, doesn't seem to have any idea of responsibility towards his workers. Uh, the workers are, are, are sort of, you know, so-called interns. Um, and uh, there's got to be what James Callaghan called a sea change in attitudes towards workers um, and b before 
they, and, and the thing happens. And I, I don't really see, I don't really see, see it happening, uh, regrettably. Uh, I, I'm inclined to agree with you. Um, I, I grew up, my parents uh, instilled in me a, a real hatred for Margaret Thatcher and um, obviously seeing the demise of the industry that um, grew from a that grew a great society that I grew up in my childhood I felt was brilliant uh, and I grew up in, in a very affluent town um, where there was lots going on but at some point um, in the late 80s the beginning of the 90s it all disappeared thanks to Margaret Thatcher and obviously we know um, the close of the mining and steel industry and all the rest of it but surely um, if if there was enough will there across Europe um, to instill some uh, social responsibility to these, do you, do you not feel that could be possible? Or, or even to divert all these misused taxes um, away from, or, or unpaid taxes away from that to develop some sort of social networks to grow like previously with the likes of Roundtree and Cadbury's or, or Bourneville? Don't you think that that could happen? But what, 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 well, it could only happen if one got a completely different kind of politician, a, a sort of politician who didn't spend half a million, um, you know, digging out his moat. Um, it, it's, it's, quite, um, it's quite easy. The, 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 sort, the sort of people who become politicians are not the sort of people who, despite their protestations, um, are liable to help anyone but themselves. And we're just moving the mic round. And it's fluttering, yeah, it's landed. Yeah. Uh, you said you'd do a couple more documentaries and that would be it. Is that just with the BBC or no more documentaries, full stop? Oh, I, I don't know. I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm sort of... I'm writing a book. Uh, I'm enjoying it very much. Um, it's uh, unbelievably sordid, um, <laughs> and um, I'm kind of <laughs> happy doing that till someone comes along and waves enough money at me to do so something else. Okay, thank you very much. <laughs> well. Well, thank you to the uh, most voracious sump of Dryberg of them all, and uh, thank you to our audience today. And uh, yes, uh, you're all very welcome. Uh, is there someone I should be handing over to now? <laughs>